Good evening to the uh, Baltimore Council members um, uh, from for the Council on Foreign Affairs. Uh, I'm Roy Gutman, a new president of uh, the council. Uh, this was to be a hybrid presentation uh, with uh, uh, in, in doing it in person uh, in the Inner Harbor uh, glorious settings, but uh, today, uh, due to the very ominous weather forecast, we decided to turn it into a, <clears throat> a live feed on Zoom uh, only. Uh, we uh, are hoping that fans of our in-person events will understand our caution. Uh, in-person will return. Um, this evening, we are continuing our focus on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, a land war in Europe, and one of the most dramatic events uh, since World War II, and one that has already brought a totally new era, uh, in the words of Henry Kissinger. Russia began the war on February 24th, uh, uh, trying to snuff out uh, Ukraine and its, ex its existence as an independent democratic state. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, obviously thought that the conquest would be a fait accompli, but, 90, but 82 days later, we can say how wrong he was. And the interesting question is, how did he get it so wrong? Uh, was it a bad plan or a bad army? Uh, can either side win? What is the real state of play? Uh, how have the military setbacks uh, weakened Russia? And what will Russia's role be in this totally new era? Uh, Michael Kaufman is one of America's uh, leading experts on the Russian army. He follows this war very, very closely. Um, he, uh, it, 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 he doesn't rely on the news media, which he criticizes for what he calls superficial, almost cheerleader kind of coverage of uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is the underdog and a very attractive underdog, but the media should uh, tell, us, tell things like they, they really are. <clears throat> he gets his data from those who are as close to the battlefront as possible. He'll tell you what he knows and he'll tell you what he doesn't know. Uh, Michael is frequently on the PBS NewsHour. He's often quoted in The Economist. Uh, I'm not sure if you've uh, all seen this issue here. This is just the last one, but, but one uh, where he is in fact uh, quoted. Um, he's, the, uh, he's a senior analyst at the Center for Naval Analyses, which is a military think tank, a very, a very prominent one, a very well thought of one, and the Kennan Institute, which is a diplomatic <clears throat> and political think tank. He studied at Northeastern University and at Georgetown. Uh, he's from Ukraine. He was born in Kyiv. Uh, he knows the language and he knows what to believe in the official statements and what not to. Michael, it's over to you. Roy, thanks for that kind of introduction. Uh, sorry I can be with you in person. Um, we'll open up with one comment. Uh, I generally don't criticize media, and I have a lot of journalist colleagues who are actually in Ukraine covering this pretty close to the to the battlefield, if not, not on it. Uh, and I think some of the coverage is actually very good. But there is a lot we don't know. And uh, barely two and a half months into this war, there are a lot of conclusions and takes that are proliferating. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of work and research to be done about what happened in this conflict, why it happened, and probably a lot of revisionist history that will have to be rapidly written, as, even as the war progresses and goes on, because a lot of the initial takes end up being wrong for good reasons. So let me first summarize a few points about this war, um, or at least my takes. And, and I'll lay out uh, my sense of why things unfold the way they did, and of course, uh, you, the audience, are welcome to be the judge uh, of, of the matter and have your own opinion on it. Uh, so first, you know, to me, this is very much a story about the supremacy of the political and the importance of political assumptions. You know, Russian political leadership had terrible assumptions about uh, Ukraine, about how this war was going to go, and suffered from exuberance and war optimism. A lot of wars start because of war optimism, particularly on the side of the aggressor. And we can summarize this very much as a tremendous case of hubris. Many regime change operations tend to go wrong, but this one's gonna be studied in history as one of the worst contemporary military debacles. The second point I make is the tremendous lack of organization and preparation in the Russian military, in large part stemming from how the operation was conceived. This exacerbated all the problems in the Russian military. It minimized Russian strength and exposed a lot of weaknesses. And I'm going to get into that in this talk. The third, that the Russian military as a force was designed with important assumptions. All militaries make trade-offs. They make choices, right? And force design is important. And here I think it's useful not just 
to have a conversation on the Russian military specifically. But, you know, the best lessons you try to learn from the militaries or the failures of, of foreign militaries rather than having to experience your own. So it's always useful to have conversation for our own military as we have four design debates to find out what went wrong here for the Russian armed forces. And the Russian military was handed a plan that really made the worst of, of the choices and the trade-offs they'd made in force design structure. And fourth point, this one I can't overemphasize enough. The Russian military showed that it couldn't scale. They'd not attempted something like this before in decades, arguably not since the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 68. And they attempted an operation with 130 battalion tactical groups, close to 200,000 men, if not more involved in the overall invasion. Uh, to me, this is uh, one of the hardest things to assess or predict as an analyst. It's the one thing you can't really know by looking at an adversary. The ability to scale is critical. And many militaries cannot scale up what they can do competently with a very limited use of force, where they can pull their best troops, they can fight as a small part of a large coalition, maybe they conduct a small expeditionary operation. But you have to assume they can you can't assume that adversaries won't be able to scale, that they won't be able to do it. And to be honest, just speaking my own experience as a, as a Russian military analyst, if I was a China military analyst looking at this war and the difference between expectations and performance, I would be sweating bullets. I'd be asking myself if I'm asking the right question about Chinese military and the Chinese ability, military's potential ability to, uh, to perform and to execute. But I won't get off on that detour, just raising it as a point. You know, in recent decades, only the U.S. Armed Forces have demonstrated the ability to organize something like this competently. And even then, it hasn't necessarily looked pretty, not always. The fifth point, context. There are a lot of things you can learn about military that, that are generalizable, at least that you can generalize as lessons. But context is king in military assessment analysis. Military power does not exist in the abstract. It cannot be measured or counted like money. It needs a context to express itself. The conditions, the planning, and the actors matter significantly. You will see a military succeed in one conflict and fail in another. It really depends on the political assumptions and the plan, but also a lot of the conditions, right? And this is important as well, as you try to take lessons away from this conflict about the Russian military and Russian military performance, and you try to figure out what can be generalized and what can be said or learned regarding uh, modern character of war, versus what is context specific and be careful not to strip all that away in the analysis. And last point, there's a lot we do not know about this war and the early takes are often wrong. They're not just often wrong, yeah, I tell you, they're usually wrong. And so I encourage all of you to consume information critically, including the things that I say here, because there's a lot of things I have to change my mind about over the last two and a half months between what I thought looking at the problems in the first two weeks versus the information that we have that's much better now about how the, the war started, All right? So you know, I'll make some broad points. I think in particular, uh, beyond the fact that of course in military analysis community, we may have overestimated the Russian military, definitely underestimated the likely effectiveness of Ukrainian military, and also the effect that direct US support would have on potentially shaping outcomes in this, in this war. I think there's a lot we don't know there, and I won't get into that subject, but it's probably gonna be an ongoing and developing conversation. Um, so I'll give you my version of events, and you can attempt to judge to what extent this was a bad army or a bad plan. I think it's both, for sure. But to me, it's probably more bad plan on balance and bad strategy and political assumptions than bad army. There are critical choices made, however, by the Russian military force design that exacerbate all these problems. A good army can try to compensate for bad political assumptions or a bad strategy. I think history will show that the U.S. military has had to do that more than once. And the Russian military showed that they just couldn't do that uh, in this case. So let's talk about the Russian plan. Um, Russian political leadership obviously thought that this would be a quick regime change operation. In fact, they assumed that maybe they'd be, uh, it'd be over in about four days. They thought Zelensky might flee or he might surrender. And they didn't expect much of a fight. They thought the Ukrainian military would surrender as well. And then they would likely organize something akin to a union state treaty, like with that with Belarus, and set up an occupation administration. All right. They had pretty big ambitions for Ukraine. Rest assured, this was a war with maximalist war aims. 
right? About as grand political ambitions as you could have. Um, the Russian military attempted to quickly build up forces outside of Kiev. That was their first move. Try to seize Gostomel Airport. And they also had some kind of political ground game, that is the Russian intelligence services, which clearly failed. And it's not clear yet why that didn't come off. There's a lot of, lot of stories coming out that maybe they paid off an opposition, somebody to subvert the Zelensky administration, that those folks simply took off with Russian money. That, by the way, is one aspect of the Russian scheme that we have yet, I think, a lot to learn about. And that's probably going to come out over the coming maybe weeks and months. That is the, the failure of intelligence. This thing's just a military failure. There was an intelligence operation, a ground game that Russian elites counted on that did not come through for them, right? I just want to highlight that because I, I can't add anything more on it. We don't know much about it. It's clear they were paying people off. It's clear they had a subversive plan, but we don't know as much about why that didn't pan out um, for them. So the Russian military going into this conflict uh, was not prepared or organized for a sustained war. Um, why? So organized a special operation and as a covert operation, the Russian military was deployed on exercises, then was pushed to the borders, but nobody amongst officers, junior officers and soldiers knew why or what they were doing. As it turned out later, the airborne troops in charge of the opening uh, operation, the attempt to seize the airport to create an air bridge so they could rapidly build up forces outside Kiev, for example, they only found out about 72 hours beforehand. But most of the ground forces only found out 24 hours or less in advance. So imagine their shock to discover that they were going from the border into Ukraine, not materially or psychologically prepared for the war, and no surprises, no surprise that the ground force component uh, had an incredibly difficult time linking up with the airborne. This is just in the case outside of, of the Ukraine capital, Kyiv. But in most cases, they were actually told that they would not face significant resistance. And of course, that was profoundly untrue. So looking at uh, the, the fundamentals, logistics, coordination between components, it wasn't there. And troops who tend to think that they're an exercise are likely to behave very differently in the preparations they make than those that think they're actually preparing to go to war. And so a lot of the things weren't there. They weren't in position, they weren't prepared. The forces had food, fuel for only a limited number of days. Key things that you would need to prepare, as I'll get into. Encrypted communications. Uh, that requires a lot of setting up. It requires a lot of training, things of that nature. Uh, if they're not deployed, if, if the troops aren't there with the right amount of training, thinking they're go go going to go to war, a lot of those things won't come together, especially on such a grand scale. So... The forces were then pushed into the war, told that they were going in to help Ukrainians liberate themselves. And believe it or not, they drove in administratively, as though they were still in Russia. They were pushing units quickly down roads, in detachments, seizing key junctions, bridges, avoiding main fights, and avoiding the big cities, except sending reconnaissance units into them. Of course, logistics couldn't keep up, and many Russian forces didn't know where they were going. Yeah, aspects of it actually, I'll tell you the truth had some similarities to U.S. Thunder runs in 03 Iraq. Unit formations dr dramatically outstripping uh, logistics, driving down roads. Uh, the initial attack, from my point of view, uh, was mind-boggling in that it was clear to Russian military that we, the United States, very likely knew what they were going to do. The U.S. was releasing all the intelligence it had, and it showed that the United States is an intelligence superpower and had tremendous awareness of Russian military preparations on planet, right? And that we were likely to convey all this to the Ukrainians. So not only were Russian elites, the political leadership, dismissive of Ukrainian capabilities, but they were clearly very dismissive of the difference our role might potentially make in the war. And I don't just mean all the weapons we have sent to Ukraine in advance. I mean actual U.S. support. And that's one of the other reasons why I think the initial opening operation, the gambit to get forces into Kiev quickly failed, right? But they, they, were, they were so hubristic and dismissive of the fact that Ukrainians would be prepared for it. So the Russian military took very heavy casualties early on in this war and then became bogged down. 
and trying to adjust, they pursued a diffuse strategy along three different fronts with many axes of advance competing actually with themselves for forces. Okay. I'll actually, well, let me see if I have the ability to share a screen here. If I do, I'll just show a map of what this looked like around March 12th, right? Around a little over two weeks into the war. Um, and see if this works. So here's an example. This is a map made by a good Olson researcher um, who uh, named Nathan, who I like to deal with. His maps are quite good. So this gives an example. If you look, you can see two acts of advance west and east of the Dnieper River by Kiev in the north. You see a very large push requiring considerable logistics all the way from the northeast towards Kiev. You see fighting and pushes to the Donbass in the eastern part of Ukraine. And you see the Southern Military District actually conducting four different axes of attack almost. One southeast along the Azov Sea coast to Mariupol, one east past Militopol towards Zaporizhia, one all the way west trying to get around Nikolaev, trying to push to Odessa. If you see those arrows in the southwestern part of Ukraine on the map, and one a little bit north towards Kriby Rig. So you can imagine the diffusion of Russian forces and how uncompetitive the strategy and approach was, right? And why they do this? So the logical thesis is, although the initial operation failed, very likely nobody wanted to admit it to Vladimir Putin that uh, the, the entire gambit uh, was a debacle and they were still trying to pursue the key political objectives with the forces they had available and, and sort of push through despite the fact that they were completely unattainable and that this diffused military strategy was likely to lead to defeat along several fronts because almost nowhere could the Russian military establish good correlation of forces, proper logistics and supply. And they were essentially attempting an advance on three different fronts and maybe at least five different axes, right? Um, so the Ukrainian military really stalled the Russian advance in the north around Kiev. They used anti-tank guided missiles to slow down a lot of Russian formations, but artillery afflicted most of the attrition and it's what pushed Russian forces back. Believe it or not, I don't want to uh, be overly categorical, but this is in many ways an artillery conflict. That's been the most decisive element if you look on the battlefield in this war. Uh, on top of that, Russian troops were not well trained for urban warfare. And a lot of this warfare was urban or suburban in terms of in terms of the terrain. And they also seem to really struggle in suppressing Ukrainian artillery. There's the things that the Russian military was supposed to be good at. Artillery. Russian military traditionally is an artillery army with a lot of tanks as a force oriented around artillery and firepower, ground based fires. They were not nearly as effective as I, as I think they expected to be. But the campaign does vary depending on where you look. The, early on, the Russian military was struggling to establish a military advantage, that's true, and they had little manpower to control terrain, but they advanced rapidly out of the south and the north, they quickly became bogged down and had big problems in logistics. And the things that sort of shape outcomes in different parts of the battlefield had to do with access to logistics and rail hubs, the ability of Russian military to project power further away from rail access, the terrain, and the amount of Ukrainian resistance, because the Ukrainian military made choices. They pulled forces from the south to defend the, the north and to defend Kharkov in the, in the northeast. Let me stop sharing the screen for a second. So on top of this, the Russian command and control was incredibly puzzling. Four military districts, each one with their own command, uh, deployed, and each one was sort of running their own operations. And you know, one thing that could be worse than having one officer in charge is having four different officers in charge, each one in some respects running their own war, and each one potentially with their own air support. I'll get us to why I think we didn't see in part a coordinated air campaign as well, a bit down the line here. And the military districts had different levels of modernization and preparation, right? Some seemed to have encrypted communications, others didn't. Some organized their forces, battalion, tactical groups. Others deployed more as regiments and brigade. And there was a big variation in terms of performance and sort of readiness and manning levels observed, a fairly uneven military, at least from my point of view. And I raise that point because even though we can broad brush certain aspects about the Russian armed forces, it was of course more interesting to me as an analyst to discover the differences between the different districts and the different units 
and what led to those differences and how uneven the force was. So despite major adjustments that took place, I think, later in March, uh, as the Russian military shifted into the second phase of the fight, this battle for the Donbass, their prospects dramatically diminished. Um, they have very few forces available for this battle now. Uh, they have primarily an advantage in fires rather than manpower, but that can't compensate for the heavy losses they took in the first phase of the war. They've lost about 15 to 20 percent of the tank and heavy infantry fighting vehicle fleet in this fight. And they have perhaps, this is one analyst opinion, information is very imperfect, right? Um, if I was to make an educated guess, and I have done this in public, somewhere on the order of 10 to 12,000 uh, killed in action as casualties. This is more than both Czech and wars combined. This is very high. Folks who don't know how casualty estimates work, it, total casualties based on that figure is a, is a tremendous amount. Um, so very sub, a substantial part of that force uh, has, has been a, attrition to the point that it's been rendered combat ineffective. And what our battalions now are actually fragments being glued together from different parts of the force and what reinforcements they could bring in. So with all that said, with big deficits in Russian planning, I have to say something else. This outcome in the war was not overdetermined. It's being painted that way, I think, a lot in public discourse. But I can see points where this conflict might have gone the other way. That is, war is always a very contingent enterprise, and there's a lot of things early on in this war that were quite contingent. As it stands, the Russian military lost in the most decisive phase of the war, which is the first three weeks. And practically speaking, we might be able to ultimately narrow it down to the first four days where this operation failed and, and, and it failed tremendously. Let me talk a bit about force structure. I won't get too deep into this topic because it might be fascinating for some listeners and incredibly boring for others. But um, so Russian force structure in many ways, from, from my point of view, was also somewhat deterministic. Uh, I often joke, show me your force structure and I'll tell you who you are as a military. Um, beyond initial operations, conventional wars often do come down to attrition, to manpower material, and the kind of big choices the military has made when it comes to force design. What they have in capabilities, what they have in capacity, what they have in readiness, and what their hedge is. That is, what happens if things go wrong? Can they replace losses? Can they replace lost, let's say, ships, vehicles? Do they have the manpower base uh, to, to replace substantial losses early on the war? The Russian military is designed as a tiered readiness force. It was intended to be flexible, to be able to generate a lot of manpower quickly as a percentage of the force, each brigade and regiment to generate two battalion tactical groups on short notice. But the rest would require partial mobilization, a raising of manning, and a declaration of war. And over time, it spread itself thinly, building larger and larger ground force formations, right, divisions, and it redu they reduced the radiance across the force to around 70% as they built more and more formations, okay? That meant that the available force for this war when you look at the military they deployed, the, the initial invasion force was actually quite small, smaller than I think a lot of us believed in the opening of the conflict. If you sort of mentally picture a brigade, let's say hypothetically, it has a, a size of 3,500 troops, right? I'm using my hands here as a sort of great PowerPoint visual aid. But at 70% readiness, in practice, it was more like 2,500 men on hand. But in the Russian military, conscripts, which in the ground force are 30 to 35%, are not considered deployable. So suddenly your deployable percentage of that force shrinks down to 1,700 or less. And ultimately that formation ends up generating two battalion, battalion tactical groups, maybe 600 each, maybe 1,200 total is what they were able to deploy. And some units that had low readiness clearly cheated and sent conscripts along with their formations. They weren't supposed to do that. But that clearly happened because um, they went into another problem. So the force they've deployed is the entirety of the available active duty military at peacetime strength. And with Putin's special operation, there's no declaration of state of war. So there's been no, no mobilization, no tremendous increase in manning and nobody to rotate 
into the war. That is, they can't take these units off the line and easily replace them with other fresh units back in Russia. There isn't a backup of force, additional capacity in the force to rotate these forces. The Russian military is explicitly not configured to sustain a war like this. It is unsustainable for them, right? And the level of attrition has been high, which compounds the problem. Let me add about some of the, a bit about some of the other big choices they made. So Russian military in designing this military, post-Cold War, made a couple of assumptions. One of them was that strategic ground defenses were, were a thing of the past, right? That was Soviet and Cold War military doctrine. There was nowhere to do big strategic ground defenses and no force necessarily to do them with. Second, that meant that they wouldn't need the logistics for it. Russian military is logistically hungry, requires a lot of ammunition, and don't need a lot of manpower to hold terrain. In fact, there's a general assumption that in Europe, you'd be hard pressed to find an army with enough manpower to hold large amounts of terrain or battle line the way you might in World War II and World War I. The Russian military focused on fire, on strike capabilities, air defense, and various types of enablers in their units. And so here comes the, the invasion of Ukraine, where they have to conduct strategic ground defenses along three fronts, hold substantial amount of terrain, fight in cities for which they don't have forces. And the Russian military found itself unable to advance and to do it quickly without mobilization or without additional reserves. And they had assumed that in the event of a larger war with NATO, that, that they would have the ability to raise manning levels. And thinking about ground war, the Russian military assumed that the fight was gonna be a fragmented, a fragmented battlefield. High maneuver formations, engaging with each other, using means of reconnaissance, you know, uh, fire, strike systems, and over time, they shrank the amount of infantry in the force. And eventually, the infantry component of the battalions in Russian military grew smaller and smaller. And then readiness came to bite as the actual manning level became smaller too, right? And those two things came together as a compounded effect because the number, the size of Russian contract force, those who were signing contracts serving the military, wasn't growing. So there are a lot of documents now captured from the war that reveal the size of Russian squads had gone down and shrank. And in practice, the size of Russian uh, uh, men and vehicles, that is the crews, and the infantry shrank as well, which meant that there was very little dismounted infantry. That began to explain why Ukrainians were fighting, finding Russian infantry fighting vehicles with nobody in them, nobody to dismount. Became in some ways the case of missing Russian infantry on the battlefield. If there's no infantry, there's nobody to support tanks. And there's nobody for tanks to support in cities either. So Russian military had a shortage of light infantry and a big shortage of dismounted infantry, in part because of the choices they made. Hard to do combined arms without infantry. This assuming you are competent in combined arms, but to do combined arms, you have to have them, All right? So moving on from that conversation, in general, if I kind of look out of the Russian military and its performance, it's not so much a failure to modernize. The main problems I saw on the Russian force going to this for, into this war was more uh, skimping on maintenance and sustainment. They had a lot of equipment. They had a modernized vehicle park, but it was older, Soviet generally, Soviet generation equipment. And it was clear that they had skimped on maintenance and that they were over-reporting their readiness levels. And I gotta tell you, just from my experience in the US, Russia definitely ain't the only military doing that. Um, over-reporting readiness levels and things like that is, 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 is not unique or distinct necessarily to the Russian armed forces. But in this case, it really revealed itself. And that's a big issue because the logistical tail available for the Russian military isn't very great. It's just not military design uh, for projecting land power uh, without, without substantial operational pauses. And, and so as a force, it was really more built around a shorter, sharper war. That's why getting bogged down in Ukraine uh, in part created all these tremendous problems for them. So to me, modernization is less a problem with the exception of air power and communications. The Russian military couldn't make encrypted comms work across the force. I think we're still not sure why. Uh, but this may have also inhibited their ability to effectively employ electronic warfare as well. And so you start to get cascade effects on the battlefield. But there are big gaps, I think, in knowledge as to why this took place, and these effects were pretty unevenly spread 
you know, across the different task forces. Um, let me make two points here about the air campaign and I'll close out a bit on the information war. So air campaign is the hardest thing to assess via open sources because there's a tremendous amount you don't know, can't see, hard to judge, right? The complexity of it, capabilities employed, how it really went from the beginning through today. You sort of get snippets and vignettes, uh, but you know, there's very limited things you can see based on what's in the media and open source. Early on, the Russian Air Force seemed missing in action, like a lot of other capabilities. The Air Force was initially involved in providing close air support and tried to do uh, suppression and destruction of, of air defenses, but they had major problems. First, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe and has a very large park of radar-guided air defense systems. I'll put it bluntly, Ukraine was pretty well armed on the air defense front. What was missing were short-range air defense, man-portable systems, and Western countries funneled a lot of these systems to Ukraine in the run-up to the war to help fix the short-range air defense issues that they would have had. Pursuing air superiority across Ukraine would have taken the Russian Air Force months, cost countless aircraft, and honestly was probably beyond the capability of the Russian Air Force as it stood. To be frank, I'm gonna yell at this. I also think it's beyond the capability of NATO Air Force whose name is not the United States in my view. Ukraine would have, Ukraine would have posed a tremendous challenge for most Air Forces to try to take on and it would have been a many months campaign. Um, I often, to be frank, I often think the United States Air Force which, which is good at this makes it look easy. Suppression destruction of air defense is probably the hardest mission you can do as an Air Force. Russian air power is quite limited in the availability of precision guide munitions, but more importantly, it's pretty limited in pilots that have good training on how to use them. And they have to big choice, they have to make a big choice between flying missions at medium altitude, getting shot down by radar guided SAMs, or going in low and getting shot by, down by man portable systems. They chose the latter of those two. Russian Air Force tried to pursue local air superiority where ground formations were advancing and operating. This meant they could increase survivability, but at the big expense of combat effectiveness. That means they weren't the big force multiplier that I think some had expected. And Russian Air Force also spent a lot of its time providing standoff missile strikes. But close air support was limited to risky low altitude missions or operating in areas where air defense had been attrition. So they were much less effective. But in general, I have to say this, Russia's Air Force is at least a generation behind Western Air Forces. It got a lot of experience in Syria, but in a very pervasive environment. In Ukraine, lack of training for dealing with uh, uh, opponent air defense revealed big limitations. To, just to be clear, this was known in the and local community. Lots of folks, including myself, had written that, that we thought the Russian Air Force would have a pretty hard time dealing with Ukrainian air defense, given its limitations. Um, but I think we're still surprised by some of the challenges they've had. And, and the fact they initially didn't try to pursue air security was both due to those limitations, but also writ large, the Russian military clearly didn't expect or plan around a large war and a substantial Ukrainian resistance. Ukraine was quite effective in using its own air defenses, shuffling units around. I'm happy to take questions on the air war later on. Um, you know, one thing Ukraine definitely demonstrated is guess what? The operator really matters because Ukraine is a lot better at using the same late gen Soviet air defenses that I've seen a lot of other militaries not be very effective with. And uh, they clearly are effective. Operator training performance really, really seems to vary. Last bit on the information war. Ukraine sees the advantage early and has kept it throughout. Russian information operators and the people in charge of that aspect of, of, uh, of Russian campaigns were clearly not aware of the actual plan to invade. Like many other people in the Russian system, they were shocked and surprised. And that surprise, I have to tell you, was frank. The actual plan to invade seems to have been fairly closely held. And it's one of the biggest things that undermined this entire operation. The other thing is just from an, a local perspective. You know, it's clear in... in in 2022, you can do a small operation covertly or a large military operation that's well-planned and telegraphed in advance. But if you try to do both at the same time, you're going to get something that looks like this, okay? 
If you attempt a large military operation, but try and make it covert, don't tell most folks in your own military and your own troops about it. Uh, and allow the other people that would be responsible for organizing this and then trying to compensate and event things went wrong. Uh, this is a fair chance. It might, it might not look as, as terrible as this, but I'm increasingly starting to see that it may be, uh, it may be one or the other is more possible. So those in charge of Russian information operations may be in the first stun, but they recovered very quickly. They focused on domestic public support and the domestic audience. They quickly began to brand the war for internal audiences. And they raise considerable domestic support. I think we debate in the ELCO community the depth and extent of true support for the war for Russia, but it is there, okay? And, and believe it or not, there's considerable domestic public support in Russia for a war that Russia's clearly losing. And the war where Russian prospects on the battlefield are incredibly poor. Because given the state of the forces, Almost no matter what happens on this current Donbass offensive, which is clearly running out of steam, it's likely to be the last offensive of the Russian military under the constraints with which they're operating, okay? Because the offensive potential of that military is likely to be attributed at this point, unless there are big political changes made in terms of partial mobilization, stop loss, raising a manning level, so on and so forth. The Russian military is going to become increasingly exhausted in the war, so the prospects are, are diminishing from my point of view, but political support is, is very much there. It's another, I think, to me, useful topic for conversation, although there's quite a bit, it's hard to measure, obviously, in a system like Russia. The other point I'll make is that most information platforms we use and look to are not just dominated by a very pro-Ukrainian narrative because we all would like Ukraine to win, um, but a decidedly you know, Western narrative and these platforms themselves are not unbiased. Facebook, Twitter are not unbiased. These are Western platforms. They're Western in orientation, okay? The medium itself has a particular slant to it. And it's two, result, two, two direct effects from that. The first is that to some extent, you are when you're watching the war, you're watching something akin to a boxing match where you only see one of the fighters and all the footage is being edited by their opponent in the contest, okay? And that's obviously going to give you one perspective on the war, but a particularly stylized or distorted perspective. The other one is to some extent, the degree of, of public support for one side in this conflict, I think is deceptive. So, and the reason I say that, what I mean by public, I mean global view, global perception, because increasingly after a couple of weeks in the war, I've seen some folks uh, look at the data, and the truth is the perspectives on this war vary considerably when you look beyond the West, which is incidentally where the majority of the world lives, like the majority of world populations. Like China, India, and, and folks in a lot of developing countries may not see this conflict in the same light. I'm not an expert on information warfare, and it's quite a bit we don't know right now about global public perceptions, but my point I want to raise to you is that there's one cohesive voice in the West but if you look beyond the West to the rest of the globe, which is actually where the majority of the planet lives, yeah, um, maybe not where most of the GDP is, but that's where most of the people are, views are much more varied and mixed. So before we pronounce the complete failure of Russian information warfare or Russian ability to shape perceptions, I would say, make sure you got the data for those assessments, because you might be surprised as to public perceptions outside the United States and allies and partners. That's just the point I want to make there. So last about uh, the intangibles. Russian choices affected morale of its troops from the outset. Obviously, lack of psychological preparation and then poor organization subsequently killed morale. It's been compounded by poor officer performance. And some places, I think I've really seen the Russian military struggle with the basics, tactics, and drills. Ukraine has done tremendously well, surprisingly well. I, but I also think often not for the reasons I see suggested in public discourse. Ukrainian morale isn't tremendously higher than it necessarily was in 2015 or 2014. It's not because Russia doesn't have an NCO core or in Ukraine does. Ukraine doesn't. It was very aspirational in the beginning to adopt an NCO core. But I've seen a lot of things sort of attributed to Ukrainian force structure that I just don't think are necessarily true. And it's not necessarily because they've adopted uh, lessons from us or years of training either. I'm sure they made an impact. 
but we should be careful ourselves of taking credit uh, for some of Ukraine's performance. So it'll take time to figure out where, where the big differences were. So um, I'll conclude this talk with, with, I, with I guess, a final thought. Um, when we think about the Russian military, uh, I would be careful walking away now, assuming that the Russian military is four feet tall. Often in defense communities, we tend not to do nuance, so the pendulum tends to swing. I spent years sort of discussing that, you know, maybe the Russian military capabilities were um, a bit hyped, and now we might be swinging very sharply in the other direction. It's very likely that over time, the Russian forces will reform, they will rebuild, and it could be a lot faster than we assume. And here, I think an analogy is useful, which is to be cautious not to make uh, the mistakes in some ways that you've seen countries make historically when they see military perform terribly in the war that they were expected to win. Perhaps the best analogy is Soviet performance in the Winter War with Finland, 1939 and 1940, and the terrible performance of the Red Army early on in that war. Germany's leadership looking at that conflict learned some things about the Red Army that were definitely true about the problems in the Soviet military. But they failed to appreciate the importance of context, and they learned quite a bit about the Red Army that turned out not to be true, at least not in their experience later on. And so that's why I say history also uh, offers a cautionary note about overly generalizing from context to context. So I'll conclude on that. As always, I say, um, be kind to my own field and be patient with the field of Russian military analysis. I think as defense communities, we're still debating what happened in World War I and World War II. So it's going to take a while to figure out what happened in this war and why. There are a number of uh, comments and questions on chat. I'm going to go first to one of our distinguished uh, trustees, Robert Friedman. What would you advise the Russian military leadership to do now? Well, that's a hard question, guys. I would not see myself in the role of advising the Russian uh, leadership, but... Um... You know, my sense of it is that Russian political leadership has an incredibly hard choice to make. They should have made it a long time ago since this was clearly, clearly visible as a disaster early on, barely a few days or weeks into the war. They've now been kicking the can down the road and making big choices on how they're actually going to sustain and prosecute this conflict. The more they do that, the more they actually will, will uh, degrade their ability to sustain the war. And I'm sure most of you know, and life teaches us, problems never get better the longer you ignore them, okay? So the issue of force availability and sustainability of this war for the Russian military only gets worse. And over time, they'll cannibalize officers in charge of training and equipping conscripts, and then they'll degrade their actual ability to rotate forces and take in new troops even further down the line. So I think their best prospect is to, um, uh, to pursue that offensive to the extent they can while minimizing the attrition and losses to the force. From my point of view, they have been trying to do that. That is, they're now much more casualty conscious and, and trying to leverage fires in, in, uh, in attempting to make gains. Second, to dramatically reduce war aims even further than they have. I mean, it's clear they've drawn, they they reduced war aims down to the Donbass and the the southern uh, regions of Kherson and Zaporizhia, most of which they occupy now. I'm not sure they're going to be able to hold on to those in their entirety, and I think they're going to have to dramatically reduce their war aims and uh, at best sue for a settlement because this is a strategic defeat for Russia. Just to be clear, there's no other way in terms of Russian political objectives to interpret the situation. And the longer the war goes on, as it does now, the more of a catastrophic defeat it'll be, actually on the battlefield over time. Right? Um, the Russian military is not going to melt away. It's not had any routes. It's not had substantial surrenders. So many of those things in terms of the problems on the force, they're not to the extent that you see these, um, uh, that you see the prospect for the Russian military quickly giving up terrain in areas where they try to hold it. In fact, ironically, the Russian retreat from Kiev and the defeated Kiev was probably the best executed part of the war for them. Now, a lot of folks don't know, but 
Militaries take the most casualties in retreat. A retreat can turn into a rout. Um, and that was probably one of the better organized parts of their operations, the withdrawal. So I guess that, that would be the crux in some of my assessment and my advice, that their best chance is to go on the defensive and then try to sue for terms and for peace because their future prospects in this war, uh, from my point of view, are dim. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much. The This is not a, a question. It, it is a, a comment, an observation from one of our anonymous uh, members. And he or she types this. Despite all of their problems, look at the horrible destruction they managed to accomplish. The, the Ukrainians they killed and the ones that were forced to flee. How can we keep focusing on their short, by their, I think the member is referring to the Russian military. How can we keep focusing on their shortfalls of the Soviet military. Do you wish to comment, Michael? Um, look, so the the war itself has been devastating for Ukraine, obviously. And uh, d- despite all the challenges the Russian military has had, it's likely inflicted significant casualties in the Ukrainian military. We actually know quite less about the state of Ukrainian forces today. I know that their losses and their level of attrition is not significant. Ukraine has lost territory. It's lost population. Millions of people have fled. And it's likely going to face a tremendous contraction of GDP, 50% or more this year. And Ukraine's southern coast, its main port, Odessa, is under economic blockade. Now, you know that port is critical for exports. And it's particularly critical for agriculture exports for Ukraine. So these are all points that are worth mentioning, right? Even though it's a strategic defeat for Russia, um, and Ukraine has been successful in Battle of Kiev and and, and on the battlefield in general, uh, Ukraine's political aims are to retake territory back to the February 23rd line, right? And the likelihood of that is still very much in question. And certainly a lot of countries and folks I speak to in Europe, I mean, they may see it as a strategic defeat for Russia, but they may not see this as a, as a victory or success either. There, there were a number of questions about Putin's health. And I think this is maybe one of, the, one of, the, one of those questions. Please comment on the reports that Putin is seriously ill. There have been years of speculation regarding his health. The honest answer is I don't know. Um, I've seen all sorts of theories. Some of them, to me, look wrong. Uh, But uh, it's quite possible he has something. He doesn't look well. I'll tell you that much. He'll look well for some time. And and he's often in person a bit awkward physically. I mean, I've seen him before in person, and there's aspects of him that strike me as awkward. But um, to me... The health, the health question is, is an interesting one to deliberate on, but also the mental health one, because he was someone who had every minute on his calendar booked months in advance. And during COVID, went from that to sitting uh, without meetings, not meeting people, establishing a prolonged quarantine protocol before anyone could meet him. No real foreign trips, no real engagements with foreign leaders not much contact with a lot of the outside world and very few individuals actually speaking to him and advising him. Spending a lot of his time having archives pulled on history, history of Ukraine. So you saw uh, his, his big article back in 21 really laid out a lot of his thoughts and, and, it, and it turned out he was quite frank of his views there. Anyone who wasn't convinced of what Vladimir Putin thought about Ukraine or his intentions, I think, by that summer, if you read that piece by him, that historical piece on his argument, uh, that Ukraine was an artificial in- invention, that Ukraine had de facto stolen Russian lands given to them by the Bolsheviks, and that Ukraine was being created as an anti-Russia, essentially a state that he wasn't going to permit to exist. Well, it was clear at that point some was thinking. So to me, I wonder, and I think a lot, a lot of colleagues in the field, especially those that, that are Russian, also wondered about how much his mental state changed 
or during those years under COVID. That's of course just a thesis, right? It's not like I'm I'm in possession of any kind of special evidence, but but I think that may have been one of the significant factors as well, beyond the different arguments made on 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 what what were the inputs into this war, right? And people do change over time, and decision making in systems, particularly personalist authoritarian systems, has a tendency to deteriorate. And he's been in charge for some 22 odd years. So I hope those are all factors as well worth considering. How is it someone with that kind of background could have been so easily lied to about the assumptions of his military and intelligence leaders? So let me make three points. First, uh, Vladimir Putin, I actually don't necessarily know to, to have tremendous military knowledge, but there's a fair chance, yes, that the military overrepresented what it can do, but not even necessarily because they lied. It's clear from what happened in this war that some of the problems and deficits on readiness they themselves found out about during the war, but they may have suspected but not really known about the depth of the rock. There's nothing like a large scale military operation to reveal the rot in, in a force, yeah? And, and you would not have known if you were 14, 15, employing four, six, eight battalion tactical groups, it would not have been obvious, right? But this, I think, revealed uh, cheating on readiness and an extent of rot in the Russian military that they themselves might not have known about. So that's the first is, yes, you may assume that the military misled them, but they may misled them in ways that they themselves didn't know about the, the problems they had. Second, Oftentimes, it's the opposite that's true, that the military tried to give sound, prudent advice, and it's the political leadership that dismissed it because it was things they didn't want to hear and that the war was a political gambit and that Putin assumed simply Ukraine wouldn't fight, would be easy to beat, and all the military risks and qualms and considerations that were raised, and a lot of evidence points more to this thesis, were dismissed by him. And that can be a challenge, too. Now we'll go down this rabbit hole, but as an analyst, you know, senior political leaders can dismiss you, right? They can assume that they that they know the situation better. They can assume they've been in charge for 22 years and they know it better than you. They have more experience than you, right? I mean, folks don't necessarily listen to things that they don't want to hear. Um, and as a third part of it, this part to me is the most puzzling. The intelligence failure here is significant. It's colossal. And it's a failure of structures that he is deeply familiar with this former head of FSB, right? And he's familiar with these people. And they clearly not only painted him a picture of Ukraine that wasn't true, but fine, he believed these things and he subscribed to things he wanted to believe. But more importantly, they painted him a picture of their capabilities in Ukraine that were clearly colossally untrue. The intelligence failure, from my point of view in Russia, is much bigger than the military failure, right? I can see all sorts of ways that with the force they employed and their assumptions and their planning that this could have gone wrong, and even if they done, even if they did attempt a phase combined arms operation, which people like me expected but were proven wrong on, that's got got the expectation of the war right, maybe the political claims right, but got the actual organization of the operation, the planning behind the wrong. Nonetheless, um, those to me are much more excusable because of how contingent this sort of thing is. Yeah, versus the colossal failures of intelligence. It's not clear to me what what Russian intelligence delivered at all in this operation. I mean, I, I can't tell anything, but they may have even delivered. So, um, and I expect that there are gonna be ramifications for that in the Russian system. Uh, but there are also a couple of questions which really amount to, hey, how does this story end? It's very hard to see look, looking out forward into a war as it is unfolding. You know, so my sense of it is that the longest war has gone on, the clearer it's become that this is going to be a, a longer dragged out conflict, right? It's not going to end soon. It's not going to end as soon as we might like. Um, I think that the Russian military's options aren't great, as I clearly laid out, and they have major problems and political choices to make. Uh, I'm not sure Ukraine will, be, will easily be able to retake the territory it's lost either. I think the war will be catastrophic economically for Russia. And they will begin to feel that much later towards August, September, the impact of sanctions and being uh, slowly disconnected from the global economy. I don't know what the implications will be for Russian regime stability 
the actual stability of the regime. That's one of the most difficult things to predict. Uh, I don't know what will happen if Russia and Polokulish tries to enact partial mobilization. Um, and the, the escalation implications are there as well, right? There, you can see pathways as this conflict progresses, that the closer Russia gets to defeat, the more likely they are to consider much more riskier options for escalation. And those risks remain out there. And I just want to highlight them. So the best I can do, you know, analysts are not crystal balls, but they can lay out some of the dark possibilities and, and, and things uh, and things to consider looking out to the future. So uh, maybe that may not be how this ends, but it's just, a, I think, a snapshot, a perspective on... Uh, what the coming months or, or year could look like. Well, I wanted to ask a question just about the Russian fleet. Uh, the Ukrainians have managed to sink the flagship, which was an astonishing achievement. Um, do they have the capability now with uh, British and other weapons arriving uh, to uh, go after the rest of the fleet? Because that's sort of one of the real symbols of power and of uh, military strength in Russia. Sure. Well, Okay, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet was a pretty old legacy Soviet cruiser. And to be honest, the Moskva had never gone through modernization. Um, I don't want to diminish Ukrainian success, but I just want to say this is a very old ship and it barely survived several rounds of retirement debates in the Russian military, right? Um, and two things to me are clear. First, that ship would, had likely had real systems issues. There's just a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that, but it wasn't necessarily fully combat ready. And second, like other parts of the Russian military, they were utterly careless. And they were basically patrolling around uh, without layered defense, without other ships supporting the Moskva, and going back and forth to familiar points. So it was much easier to track and target. That is, they, the Russian Navy was in many ways no smarter about... Uh, uh, taking the Ukrainian military seriously than other parts of the Russian military, and it really showed. There's still a, it's a parable about underestimating your opponent. Um, you know, regarding the rest of the Russian fleet, yeah, over time they can be threatened as Ukraine onlines more and more uh, coastal defense cruise missiles, but uh, the blockade remains, and the Russian Navy has many options to blockade Ukraine without even need of service combatants. The strike itself is significant. It's a big PR victory. But I'm sure those folks in the Navy didn't learn much new here about ship vulnerability to land-based assets, yeah? Um, and about the challenges of maintaining, trying to maintain an inner blockade and what happens when you're, care where, when you're, you're careless and your ships are not necessarily fully operational and you don't really have a good assessment of the vulnerabilities. Um, the maritime commercial blockade will endure as a problem because you'll be hard pressed to find people to insure commercial vessels to go to a port. And even if a nation insures them, you know, you'll dealing with commercial ships and establishing that kind of blockade, Russia can do it any number of ways without even need of surface combatants. The main role the Russian Navy has had is firing land attack cruise missiles into Ukraine, maintaining the sense of the sort of outer blockade and using uh, its limited, um, amphibious capability, basically LSTs, landing ship tanks, to provide supplies within the Sea of Azov. So it's not, it's not had a tremendous role, but it has had a role. Uh, we really are grateful to you, uh, Michael, for <clears throat> spending time with us and, and taking our questions. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks for the kind questions and the conversation. Mm -hmm.